Chapter 2. Is there a limit to big business? If the worker is to be able to buy what he makes, that is, if the wage motive is fully to be carried out, then the large corporation is inevitable. Putting the worker in a position to buy what he makes, of course, has its exceptions, and the thought applies principally to commodities. One would not expect the worker to buy a pipe organ, or a steamship, or a skyscraper. As a worker, he would have no use for any of these things. But he has use for good food, good clothing, good housing, and a reasonable amount of pleasure, both for himself and for his family. He cannot get these things by any political device, or through any bargaining organization, such as a labor union, for goods are created neither by law nor by bargaining, which, strangely enough, does not seem generally to be recognized. Many foreign labor leaders have visited me during the past several years, and, without exception, they have talked politics, while the industrial leaders from abroad have talked politics only in a defensive way. Their chief interest, or at least so it has appeared, has been in finding ways and means to adjust the differences between labor and capital. Of course, when one thinks in terms of labor and capital, one begins to think in a circle— but at least these men were groping for a way out through production, while the labor leaders seemed principally to want the opportunity to hold office and make speeches. The people have been taught to fear the great corporation. They fear it partly because they do not understand it, and partly because they are afraid of monopoly. Also, they have a fear of the money power, and confuse big business with big money power. Their thinking is many years behind the times. They are back in the days when a million dollars was a large sum of money, and when it was taken as a fact that no man could make or use a million dollars honestly. Whoever started that saying must have been a man of the narrowest vision, else he would have known that it is much easier to make money honestly than it is to make it dishonestly. The only important point in all this is that people think of business, and especially big business, as something of dollars, instead of something of service. Now, let us remember that this is today, and not yesterday or tomorrow. The world has always needed leadership. Yesterday, that leadership was military and political. It made no difference what form of government any country had. It was successful when it had leadership, and it failed when it did not. Neither military nor political leadership is creative. Business was called successful only when it took away something that someone else had already created. However, there is no use quarreling with the past. The kind of leadership that the past got was undoubtedly the leadership it needed. But times have improved, and today political and military leadership cannot serve the people as well as industrial leadership. Quite likely, the political leadership everywhere is about up to the average. The reason why it seems to be below the average is that people have fallen into the habit of asking politics to do what only industry can do. The professional reformers do not understand this. They think that politics can do what only industry can do, and they propose regulations of prices, and of this, that, and the other thing, on the ground that thus they can bring prosperity. There is a craving for a prosperity ordained by law, and it is entirely natural that there should be. For the idea is rather general that the chief curse of life is to work for a living. Thinking men know that work is the salvation of the race, morally, physically, socially. Work does more than get us our living, it gets us our life. But somehow prosperity, and everyone agrees that it is good to be prosperous, is mixed up with high prices and high wages. And since both prices and wages can apparently, though not actually, be raised by law, it would seem that some law could substitute for work. Everyone should know by this time that true prosperity is marked by a reduction of prices, and that this is the only way by which prosperity can be made the normal condition, and prevented from being merely spasmodic. Consider a few fundamental principles. First, why should we ever have prosperity at all? Prosperity being the easy and uninterrupted supply of need, and the needs of our people being normal and varied, and the means to supply these needs being ample, with a surplus left over for those afar whose sources of supply have not been developed. The more logical question is, why should we ever be without prosperity? 
even in hard times, we have every element of prosperity, so that the puzzle is that we should ever have to endure hard times, except through bad management of our affairs. The economic basis of prosperity is always present. But men must be led into prosperity. A mob is powerless except for destruction. All men are not voluntarily intelligent. They must be taught. All men do not see the high escape from drudgery and work by putting intelligence into work. They must be taught. All men do not see the wisdom of fitting means to ends, of conserving material, which is sacred as the result of others' labors, of saving that most precious commodity, time. They must be taught. Industry must have generalship, and of a high order. The great corporation is the inevitable consequence of industrial leadership. How great will corporations grow? Is there a limit to their size? And if so, what is that limit? Should they be regulated to serve the public interest? What are the dangers of monopoly? Should monopoly be restrained? These questions will more or less answer themselves if we look at how a serving corporation comes into being. First of all, it has to be designed to furnish some service. The corporation has to follow the service. The service does not follow the corporation. The design is what counts. Everything in this world, to be made rightly, has to follow a design. And time spent in getting a thing right is never wasted. It is time saved in the end. But here someone may ask, what am I going to design? You may take something which people already know about and try to make a better design than is being offered. That might be the course to follow in commodities. But probably a better way is to judge the wants of the people by your own wants. Then start from where you stand and let the public make your business for you. The public, and only the public, can make a business. If we have good steel today, it is because the public bought steel when it was faulty and thus help the steelmasters to perfect their science and production. If we have comfortable transportation today, it is because the people were willing to pay for uncomfortable transportation and let the system grow up. If we have swift, durable, and dependable motor cars today, it is because the people bought motor cars when they were largely in the experimental stage. If we have the varied products of petroleum today, it is because the people bought and burned coal oil and by their confidence and patronage set the oil industry on its way to a worldwide service. Since the public makes a service, the primary obligation of business is to the public. Those who work for and with the business are part of this public, and this settles one fundamental corporate policy, to whom shall the profits of improvements accrue. Suppose an industry, through efficiency and approved service, is able to reduce costs to the consumer. It gives the benefits of its improvements to its customers. If an article cost a dollar less to produce than formerly, a dollar comes off the price charged the consumer. By that process, more people are able to buy. More buyers make a still larger business. A larger business still further reduces costs, which in turn increases the business still more. Now, it is obvious that, however efficient the idea of economical production in that factory may have been, no such growth would have followed had the economy not been shared with the public. Suppose that the one dollar saved was added to profits, the price to the consumer remaining the same. There would have been no change in the volume of business. Suppose the dollar saved had been added to wages, there would have been no change in the volume of business. But, by sharing the profits with the public, comes an immediate and great public benefit. There is a stimulating reaction on the business. Prices go lower. Business increases. Thousands of men are employed where but scores found work before. Wages increase. Profits mount. By starting at the right end, prices go down, which is to say that to the public, values go up. Wages go up, and surplus goes up. The point is, this did not come by doing what is sometimes demanded, turning all the profits into wages. It is accomplishing more benefit for the wage earner with a family of five to reduce the cost of necessities for the members of his family than to increase his pay without reducing his costs. 
increased pay comes through increased business, and no increase in business is possible except by lowering prices to the public. Labor is more of a buyer than a seller. The point at which to start the wheel a-rollin' is the buying end. Make things easy for the plain people to buy. That makes work. That makes wages. That makes surplus for extension and greater service. The burden of it all is on the shoulders of management. Labor works along under any system. There is little or no concern in the shop whether the best method is being used, whether the best results are being had from materials, and from the motions of men. It is a day's work just the same. The difference in a day's work is in production value, and this is the business of management. Suppose a business has grown and prospered under this policy of serving the public. It is not self-sufficient. It must buy on the outside. Its supplies are threatened. The mismanagement of businesses that supply the raw material causes strikes which delay it. Or the fast-passing policy of charging all that the traffic will bear is used to run up prices unreasonably, preventing the proprietor from selling his commodity to his customers at a price which is right for him and for them. He finds himself at the mercy of the misleaders of labor outside his business and the profit gougers who supply his raw material. Obviously, it is his duty to protect his customers. They need a certain commodity at a price they can afford to pay, and they are threatened with seeing this forced up to a price which they cannot afford to pay. The business, the manufacturer, must at once decide whether he will have his service to his customers limited by forces beyond his control, or whether to the extent of his resources he will make his own supplies. If he decides, as we decided, that the quantity and quality of our service should be within our control, then gradually he will be drawn, at least to a protective degree, into the manufacturing of raw materials and into many ramifications, such as later will be described in our own progress. And with the taking over of the very first source of raw materials comes the test of service. In every one of the raw materials used, there was a profit, a coal profit, a limestone profit, an ore and blast furnace profit, a lumber profit, a transportation profit, and so on. Is the manufacturer to collect for himself each of these profits and add it to the profit he receives for turning these raw materials into an article of use? Not if he is a true businessman, operating on the principle of service and taking only a legitimate replacement and expansion surplus. He abolishes all subsidiary profits and gives the consumer the benefit of them. The former profit, which the public gave him to enable him to expand, now comes back to the public in the form of a stabilized supply, a stabilized cost price, and a lower sales price. The number of the profits saddled on one commodity has been reduced. The test of the service of a corporation is in how far its benefits are passed on to the consumer. The reduction of profits in number and amount on any commodity is an instant and general community benefit. Is such a business a menace or a benefit to the public? It must be a benefit to the public, else it would not grow. It has grown through serving the public, and the limit of its size is its ability to serve the public. That ability to serve may be limited by management, or it may be limited by transportation. We have not found any difficulty in management, largely because, as has been explained in a former book, we have no rigid management. We have just grown, and as each unit has been added, someone from the ranks has appeared to undertake the management. The real limit to the size of a corporation is transportation. If it has to transport its commodity too far, then it cannot give service, and it limits its own size. There is far too much transportation anyway, too much useless carting of goods to central points from there to be distributed to points of consumption. If low prices and high wages are a menace, then the great industry is a menace. The corporation formed not to give service but only to sell its stock is another matter which will be taken up subsequently. There are people who think of big business as dangerous because it is big. They believe that the old way of each business being self-sufficient in its own town is the right idea. And 100 years ago, it was the right idea. 
Each cobbler in his little town made the shoes, and they were good shoes. The local wagon maker made his wagons for the townsfolk. The point to be remembered about the establishment of industry is that while all these various new ideas were being developed, the people who paid for them were the people who bought. No tractor, no thresher, no motor car, no locomotive, no new industrial device has ever been developed unless the people paid the expenses. The old idea of business, that it consists of one man getting the better of another man, is no longer acknowledged as businesslike, even by those who practice it. The American idea of business is based on economic science and social morality. That is, it recognizes that all economic activity is under the check of natural law, and that no activity of man so continuously affects the well-being of others as does the daily activity of business. We do not have to ask for the public regulation of business. The public has always regulated business. Monopoly, or the super-control of commodities, seems an impossibility among an enlightened and resourceful people. A people that would not stand a tax on tea, would they stand absolute despotic control of the things they need for life? A people that freed their slaves, would they turn slaves themselves? The pin-maker is permitted to make pins as long as they are good pins. If not, someone else will make them. The real controller is always the public. Big or little business goes along in response to a demand, and the demand is created by the service rendered. Stop the service, and the demand ceases. Stop the demand, and where is big business? All the money in the world could not stop competition among Americans. To do one thing well stimulates others to do it better. Business grows big by public demand, but it never gets bigger than the demand. It cannot control or force the demand. There is no super control, save that of the people reacting to the service they get. The only monopoly possible is based upon rendering the highest service. That sort of monopoly is a benefit. Any attempt artificially to monopolize is only a method of throwing away one's money. But will not the growth of the great corporation shut off individual initiative? Where is a young man going to turn? Is it better for a man to take employment with another or to go into business for himself? The question is legitimate when asked in full knowledge of two facts, that there are more doors into private business today than ever before, and that employment has come to compete with private business as a career for any man. Men are constantly passing from one field into the other. In any large business may be found men who have been in business for themselves and have given it up. There may also be found men who hope someday to give up employment and set up for themselves. The motives of those who leave business for employment are various. Some find themselves unable to bear the strain. They are fitted to serve, but not also to direct the services of others, or even adapt their own service to the changing needs of the time. So they take employment where they can serve under direction, certain of an income, and free to cultivate the other interests of their minds. Some accept employment because they see in extensive modern business the widest and most inviting outlet for their powers. What would take them a lifetime to build, they find ready at hand, built by another, and needing their service. That is the appeal of modern business to the young man. He can begin with an organization whose crude experimental days are over and which stands able to do the thing it was organized to do, and to do greater things because increased experience leads to greater and more successful experiment. In private business, one enters an atmosphere of competition, whereas in large employment, one enters an atmosphere of cooperation. A great modern industry progresses by the unified thought and energy of many men. Theirs is a cooperation based not on emotional agreement or personal preference, but on common interest in the job to be done. And the opportunities to acquire position and competence are greater in employment than in private business, because there are more places to be filled, and the rewards are larger. Salaries in this country are greater than profits. Those who feel that business is jealous of the employee's progress are behind the times. Business can live only as it develops within its core of employees the talent and the force which will carry the business along. 
Business lives by the vigor and brains of the men it produces, and every big business needs more and bigger men than many, many small businesses could possibly need. With this larger need comes larger opportunity. We have come to a point where there are more things to be done than we have men to do them, and it is big business which has brought all this about. When there were more men than opportunities, there was struggle of a very fierce and often inhuman kind. But to assume that such is the essential law of business practice and business success in these days is nonsense. From a condition where it was believed that competition decreased business, we have advanced to a condition where we know that competition increases business. This is because opportunity exists in multitude where before it was scarce. Now, big business, based on service, regulates its own size and conduct. If it is based on money instead of service, then we have another matter. <laughs>